I'm going to preface this with, uh, this is a good news, bad news package. And I just want to warn you of that as we go forward. And, and I expect that some of you might walk away feeling a little bit sobered. And I expect that some of you might walk away feeling um, motivated, inspired. I'm hoping that you feel both as you walk out of here. But um, let's start by um, just doing a little bit of context. Uh, Maryland introduced NCG. Uh, we are a co-op. We're owned by 143 consumer co-ops across the country. Uh, those co-ops operate 190 stores in 38 states. And together, we have a sales volume, annual sales volume, of almost uh, $2 billion, $1.7 billion, which is fantastic. It's phenomenal. It's a testament to uh, what you've been able to accomplish in your local markets and in your communities that we've gotten here. Um, just uh, some more context. Uh, retail food accounts for $640 billion annually. Um, and that's 55% of all food. The other 45% is food service, restaurants, commissary. Uh, natural and organic accounts for 100 billion, or about 15% of retail. That's really significant. When co-ops hit the, when natural and organic uh, hit 100 billion, it was a signal that something big was happening here, something worth the attention of investment. This started to attract investors. And it's actually, especially, that 15% annual growth that's happening in the natural and organic industry that has really attracted them. Um, just as some context, conventional markets, conventional grocery grows at about 3% annually, just barely keeping up with inflation. So 15% double digit growth is really, really attractive. And it's led to some com competition. Now, most of these folks you are familiar with, um, NCG is there in the middle with our 1.7 billion. Um, then there's Fresh Market, who uh, regional competitor here, Sprouts, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods accounts for uh, almost 13 billion in sales annually. So we're in the middle of a, of a pack, and the pack is expanding, it's growing. So we wanted to figure out why this was, what was going on, what was different now. We've always had Whole Foods, they've never had this kind of impact before. What was different? What was causing this? And we worked with a group called the Hartman Research Group. And they did some research for us. They actually, they actually started to do research uh, taking your co-op shoppers, the cross-section of co-ops, about 60 across the country, different kinds of markets. And they sampled the shoppers. What are your habits? What do you do? What do you buy? And they put that against the backdrop of national trends. And uh, the first thing that they showed us that we recognized and we thought was really great um, is what they call the rise of fresh. Now in the 80s, the idea of health and wellness, and the way Hartman defines this is, health and wellness is the idea that what you put in your bodies, what you put on your bodies, what you do with your bodies, matters for overall well-being. Sound familiar? It's because you guys were doing it uh, as early as the 70s and 80s. That was what co-ops came from. And at the time, in the 80s, it was a counterculture idea. It was not a mainstream idea. It was alternative to think that way. In the 90s, it started to change a little bit. And it led to the rise of our friend Whole Foods. Um, Whole Foods took this idea and they said, let's figure out how we can make a ton of money on it. And they were very successful. They turned health and wellness into an aspirational lifestyle. It's something you could do if you had the money to do it. And it was at that point our co-ops really had to start fighting the price image war um, because people were rightly associating the product with an elite lifestyle. The, that lasted for uh, about 10 years or so and then it started to change again. And what happened is that what was aspirational, what was originally counterculture then became aspirational, suddenly became the norm. You guys won. You are victims of your own success because now everybody wants access to this health and wellness lifestyle. Everybody, regardless of uh, economic status, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of political persuasion, they want healthy foods for their families. They believe in the health and wellness lifestyle. So in a sense, you should pat yourselves on the back and there are implications for us. Um, the reason why there's this 15% growth in the industry, the reason why there's so much investment is because as this population that wants natural and organic grows, um, it is uh, coming to market very strongly. They're calling them the mid-level shoppers. 
And to understand the mid-level shoppers, let's start with the core shoppers. I think that's the easiest because my guess is that you are all core shoppers. Core shoppers spend most of their buying at the co-op. They volunteer. They participate. They know the issues. They know what organic means. They know what natural doesn't mean. My guess is uh, that they participate at board meetings. They come to the annual meeting. They're the most likely to fill out the customer comment forms when they don't like something. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the peripheral shopper. The peripheral shopper wants certain products for the cheapest price they can find. They come in with very small baskets. They buy one or two items, and they probably complain about the price. Uh, the core shopper, you guys, make up 13% of the adults shopping in your co-op, but almost 25% of the sales. The opposite is true of the peripheral shopper. They make about 25% of the sales, and 15% uh, uh, or sorry, 10% of spending. And in the middle we have the mid-level shopper. Uh, it's about 60% of adults, 65% of shoppers. The mid-level shopper has different needs than the core shopper. And those needs are important to understand. Um, we think that it's possible to serve the mid-level shopper and the core shopper well. We really do. Um, but there are some things about the mid-level shopper that are a little bit different. If you look at these qualities, quality and freshness of uh, a product, those are uh, consistent between the two shopper groups. So is knowledgeable staff. Core shoppers and mid-level shoppers want a knowledgeable staff. Um, what's different is that mid-level shoppers really value the ambiance, the atmosphere of the store. Um, they, they really value wanting the brands that they want, that their family wants. An example of where we might lose the shopper is we don't carry Toms of Maine anymore because they got purchased by Colgate. Okay, We don't carry this product because it doesn't fit in our product guidelines. Product guidelines are very important. They help define who we are. But this group of shoppers, they want the product that they're familiar with. Uh, also, cleanliness of store, very important to the mid-level shopper. But we still think it's possible to serve both groups. The other thing that's important to remember about the mid-level shopper and shoppers in general is that they cross shop. We used to think of the co-op shopper as somebody who dedicated all of their purchasing to the co-op. They were, they were loyal to us. And there are some like that. But actually, the truth is, of co-op shoppers, uh, the average co-op shopper shops 3.5 places to get their groceries. They are going to other places already. Um, that's actually more than a natural food shopper who doesn't shop at a co-op. It's about 3.1 places. Uh, other trends that have changed that are interesting, uh, it used to be that the average shopper shopped once a week for groceries, now it's twice on average. So the mid-level shopper is bringing different habits to the market, habits that we need to be aware of. Um, and the mid-level shopper has led to what we're calling the new supernatural. The new supernatural, the old supernaturals, by the way, are Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, they're really those. Uh, new supernaturals are regional natural foods players who have gotten a lot of investment money. And these people are coming to market hard in different regions. Um, everybody here is probably familiar with Earth Fair, um, Fresh Market. Those are two regional players that have a lot of investment money behind them that are growing into other regions now. In the Southwest, we have Sprouts. Um, Sprouts is moving into the Southeast now. I think they just opened up a store in Atlanta. Um, and they're heading in this direction. Sprouts is a very strong competitor. They're growing at about 20% annually. Lucky's is, and Fresh Time are both offshoots of Sprouts, but they tend to execute a little bit better on Delhi. So these are all new players coming to market that want a piece of your sales. They want some of your shoppers, and they're taking mid-level shoppers before they get to your store. Whole Foods is planning to open about 40 stores this year. Uh, Sprouts is going to open 10 stores just in the first half of 2015. Earth Fair, brand new CEO, already started up ramp, uh, ramping up the store production for Earth Fair again. Um, fresh time, 23 stores this first year. Trader, uh, Trader Joe's named best grocery store in the U.S. But what was more interesting about this headline is Kroger beats Whole Foods. Kroger sells more organic foods than Whole Foods does now. We've got some old friends. Walmart, Publix, Food Lion, Super Target. People used to go to these stores to get their organic food. We used to say they're not our shoppers. What we're saying today is we need to change that thinking. We need to stop thinking, those aren't my shoppers, and start thinking, why aren't they our shoppers? Because I believe that each of your co-ops have something really great to offer people. 
that you have a much better impact on your communities than these folks, that you have much more product knowledge. And we want these people, the people who shop at these stores, they actually want that. They just don't know it yet. Um, we think of the mid-level shopper as a continuum. That if we can get them to be peripheral shoppers to stop in our short stores once, um, and then we can get them to be mid-level shoppers and give them the products that they want, and then eventually, three years down the road, they're at our annual meetings and writing angry customer comments to us as core shoppers. That's what we want. Uh, we think that we're worth it. But we have this barrier to go through, which is conventional competition. Costco plans 150 new stores in five years. Kroger organic brand is about to hit 1 billion in sales. That is their private label organic brand. That's not all of the sales that come out of that store. That's just their private label. Walmart promising whole organic foods for everybody. This is their, their merger with the Wild Oats private label brand. Target's making big push into natural organic. Um, the next Trader Joe's revamping their groceries to be more competitive. This is the, uh, this is the conventional world and it's, it's um, I'm sorry, that was Target revamping their groceries. This is the conventional world and it's actually a bigger threat we think than the natural uh, competitors. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if all of us are ready, but I think that we are. I think that we've got a plan, but we really need to look at ourselves closely to see what it is that we do. We've been here before. Marilyn talked about the previous two waves and what happened to them. We have more resources now to help co-ops get through this current challenge than has ever been available. We think co-ops can do it. We think we can avoid the hoop um, here, the downward turn in co-op development. We think we can avoid that, but it's going to take some changes. It's going to take changes, and the one that I care the most about, and I think we'll talk about a lot today, I'd love to hear what you're thinking about this. For me, the one I care the most about is, what are the barriers to people shopping at our stores? If we have to convince people to pass by two grocery stores to get to ours, what are the barriers that would prevent them from doing that? What are the barriers to the mid-level shopper finding a welcoming place in our co-ops? Can we eliminate those barriers? If we can't, if our parking lot is the problem, can we come up with a plan so that we can fix it in three years? Because these things matter. This competition is not going away. It's going to continue to grow at the rate it's growing. It's going to continue to have an impact on our stores, and we need to be better operators. We need to be better operators. And I'm not saying mimic our competitors. I don't think that's the right answer. But we need to reinvest in what it means to be a strong retail organization to attract these mid-level shoppers and where we can learn something from our competitors that are doing this quite well, we should be open to the idea. Because what differentiates us is not necessarily the way our store looks. It's what you do in your communities and what you do at your co-ops that we think are the most impressive in terms of what differentiates us. We want, you to be re we want everybody to be stellar retailers so that we have the ability to continue to deliver on the promise of what co-ops are. We think that this time it's going to be different. Uh, but it's going to require every co-op to make some changes and rethink some things. Uh, we hope that this conversation uh, continues, and, and you have a conversation about this today that it continues. We'll bring it forward over the course of this year. Um, but truly, this is, about find, this is about figuring out a way so that the amazing things that you do at your communities, the amazing things that you do at your co-ops can continue, and that you can continue to have an impact on, a, on, a, on, your, um, on your markets. That's it.